Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today's webinar. My name is Sakshi Sethi, and I manage OSA's corporate membership program, also known as OIDA. I am really excited to introduce today's webinar. It's sponsored by one of our corporate members, Menlo Systems. Um, before we get started, I just want to take a minute to review a couple of housekeeping items. So as you're getting settled in, um, just uh, pay attention just for a couple of quick reminders um, and tips. So if you need any assistance today, um, during the presentation, I ask that you use the chat icon. It's located at the bottom of your screen. Um, this will enable you to send me a message directly. I'd be happy to assist you if you have any technical issues, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, um, please use the chat box to get in touch with me. Um, during this webinar, we also really encourage you to ask our speaker questions. Um, so there is a second button at the bottom of your screen. It's called the Q&A icon. Um, you'll simply type your questions there and you'll hit submit. Um, we have a couple people from Menlo Systems that have joined this uh, webinar simply to help answer and field all of your questions. So I really encourage you to use this opportunity to be able to engage with them and get your questions answered. And then a final reminder is that this webinar is being recorded. Um, once it's recorded, we'll be able to uh, post it online afterwards so that you're able to rewatch it. So in case you have to drop off a couple minutes early, want to share the link with a colleague to watch later, you're more than welcome to do so. And I'll drop that link in the chat box here shortly on where you can find the video recording in a couple of days online. And so that's everything that I have for housekeeping. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to our first speaker, Patricia, to get us started. Thank you. Thank you, Sakshi. Welcome to the second part of our webinar mini series on optical frequency combs. I'd like to briefly introduce our company, Mandlo Systems. Founded 20 years ago as a Planck Institute for Quantum Optics, Mandlo Systems is today counting about 130 employees. Our headquarters are in the west of Munich in southern Germany, and we hold offices in the US and in China. Menlo Systems is the pioneer of the optical frequency comb technology. Our co-founder, Professor Ted Hench, received the Nobel Prize in 2005 for this invention. Dr. Michael Mai is our CEO and Dr. Ronald Holzwort is our CTO. We serve customers worldwide with applications in science and in industry. While we continuously expanded our product portfolio by femtosecond lasers, ultra-stable lasers, and terahertz systems, the COMP technology has remind, re remained our focus. Our first titanium sapphire-based optical frequency COMP systems, as you see it on the left side, had occupied a large portion of an optical table. With our patented figure nine mode locking technology, we are able to provide systems which are modular, most compact, and worldwide unique in terms of stability, accuracy, and reliability. Uh, let me introduce our speakers for today. So our main speaker will be Dr. Doug Schmidt, who is product manager for the optical frequency combs at Menlo. Doug studied physics in Karlsruhe and Tübingen in Germany and received his PhD in physics um, in Tübingen too. And Doug joined Menlo Systems in 2017. Assisting with the Q&A session will be Dr. Ben Sprenger, who is regional sales manager in Berlin and expert in quantum technology and metrology. Ben studied physics at the Imperial College in London, University of California. He received his PhD in physics at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Light in Erlangen. And he then was a postdoc in quantum optics at the Humboldt University in Berlin and finally joined Mendel Systems in 2015. Michele Junta, his product manager for the photonic microwave generator and quantum technology comb systems. Um, Michele received his Master of Science in Physics Engineering from the Politecnico di Milano in Italy and joined Mendel Systems in 2013. 
Michele is currently guest researcher and PhD candidate at the Max Planck Institute for, of Quantum Optics in Garching. With this, we hope that you enjoy the webinar and we are looking forward for your questions. Doug, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Patricia. So also from my side, welcome to the second part of the Menlo Systems uh, Comp webinar, this time about frequency comp based laser systems for optical clock and quantum technology applications. So let's start with the overview. If the slide would change, yes, it does. So I want to start with a basic idea about frequency comp based laser systems and why that is an appealing approach. And because uh, the system I will talk about mainly is uh, built for optical clocks. I want to say a few words on the evolution of clocks in general and especially of state-of-the-art optical clocks. And for a state-of-the-art optical lattice clock, for example, you need, of course, a state-of-the-art uh, frequency comp. And that's why I will tell you how we qualify our frequency comp to make sure you get the best comp for your application. And then the second part of the webinar will be about the real thing, the FC1500 quantum. And as I said, uh, this uh, special system here, this customized system, it was built for a strontium lattice clock. And then I told you, uh, I promised in the first webinar, I will also say a few words about ultra stable microwaves. And of course, uh, I will keep my promise. And in the end, uh, we will have a, a short product demo about the FC1500 250 ULN. So a short reminder, um, the frequency comp itself, as we have seen in the first webinar, in the time domain, this is a femtosecond pulse train here, the electric field. Over time, you can see here between the pulses, there's a time t, which is the inverse of the repetition rate. And there is a phase shift in between the carrier and the envelope, which is delta phi. And from this phase shift, there results an offset frequency in the spectrum. So in the frequency domain, we have the frequency comp spectrum, which is totally defined by two parameters, the repetition rate and the offset frequency. And maybe, yes, I can activate the laser pointer. OK. So any mode number here, any mode of the frequency comp can be described by this simple formula. So any frequency of any line is given by n times the repetition rate plus F0, and n is an integer number. And an optical frequency comp is a pulse laser with stabilized repetition rate and carrier envelope offset frequency. And this means, this comp formula means that you really link the optical domain to the RF domain. So a frequency comp is a clockwork, an optical clockwork, as shown here in this very nice picture by uh, Scott Didims, uh, the group of Scott Didims. And uh, yeah, for example, 429 terahertz, which corresponds to 698 nanometer, the strontium clock transition, is divided into integer parts of the repetition rate and an offset frequency. And therefore, you have this clockwork behavior here. You directly link the optical to the microwave or RF domain. So now, the basic idea of frequency comp laser systems is rather simple. As I've shown you in the first webinar, we also provide subhertz line with ultra stable lasers. And if we lock our comp to these ultra stable lasers, we do so called spectral purity transfer, and we are capable of having subhertz line with on all comp lines. And then the second step is just to lock different lasers to the frequency comp, because the frequency comp now is a universal frequency reference, subhertz frequency reference for all the lasers. And these subhertz line with CW lasers are now the outputs of the frequency comp based laser system for your high end application. So, like I said, we're doing two times spectral priority transfer here from the ultra stable laser to the comp and from the comp to the CW lasers. So, here are a few examples of these high end applications. Well, <clears throat> I will talk especially about the optical lattice clocks in this talk. So, they provide ultimate frequency stability and accuracy. They are the next candidates for the redefinition of the second. And the comp acts as a clockwork and also as a flywheel, as I will show you in the next slides. But also quantum technology. Uh, yeah, quantum technology uh, needs such systems. And in, uh, for quantum manipulation and sensing, you want to read out and control single qubits. You will have to have uh, precise control about your atoms. You need to cool and trap them. And yeah, you want to shape optical potentials. And here's a picture from Atom Computing, a startup company which is building scalable quantum computers. And as a third um, example, I wanted to show you here is precision spectroscopy. For example, people are measuring 
all around the world if they can see drifts and fundamental constants. Even anti-hydrogen spectroscopy is done nowadays at CERN. And also the proton size puzzle is a very interesting, uh, interesting uh, problem. And you can see here, a science paper here from 2020, where you see different proton charge radiuses, uh, which is indeed quite puzzling. So different, me different measuring techniques lead to different proton charge radiuses. And this is, of course, uh, puzzling, but also very exciting if there are yeah, different, uh, different results. OK, and uh, yeah, since I wanted to talk about optical lattice clocks, uh, <clears throat> I also wanted to give you a short uh, introduction to clocks in general, and then, of course, to the optical lattice clocks. And I think today no one would argue that timing matters, but also in the 18th century, timing did matter, especially if you are uh, part of the seafaring uh, companies, because there was a so-called problem, the longitude problem. And this was a problem of navigation. Uh, people simply didn't know exactly on the ship where they are uh, in sense of degrees of longitude, because uh, a navigator has the sun and the stars if you're on the ocean. And you can use them for the north-south north, north south, uh, navigation. This is not too bad because the angles will not change. They will only change over the terms of the year. But uh, the Earth uh, just rotates all the time. It won't stop, which is in principle a good thing. But it's a bit annoying if you want to navigate a ship over the ocean. So what can you do? Well, you can use a clock and the sun. And how do you navigate with a clock and the sun? I try to explain this here. So let's start in London. London is at zero degree longitude per definition. And if the sun reaches the highest point in the sky, you should calibrate your clock to 12 o'clock. And now we just wait for one hour. And in the reference frame of the Earth, the sun will travel. Let's say the sun travels. So the sun travels from east to west. And after one hour, it's 1 p.m. now in London, the sun will have traveled 1 24th of the complete circle, so 15 degrees in longitude. And this is a very useful information, because if you start your journey now, then it will, of course, take longer than the sun, because a ship is not as fast as, as the rotation of the Earth. But if you start traveling, and maybe after a few days or even a week or so, uh, the navigator will look in the sky, will check again when does, does, does the sun reach the highest position. And finally, he will see, oh, this happens at 1 o'clock. And this is the watch the clock we already had in London. So this is still London time. And that means, well, also the ship now managed to travel 15 degrees of longitude. And this is quite a valuable information uh, yeah, to have this and probably saved a few lives there. If you check for your food and your water, you want to know the longitude. And this guy here, John Harrison, was a clockmaker. And he was the one who solved the longitude problem. Because uh, at this time, state-of-the-art clocks were pendulum clocks but a pendulum clock is not very accurate on a rocking ship. So they had to come up with another solution and John Harrison did. So he invented the so-called Sea Watch and this is model four, which was the breakthrough. He invented this thing in 1753. And this almost looks like a pocket watch, but it's 13 centimeters in diameter and 1.5 kilogram. So not really for your pocket, but still very beautiful device. And this one has no pendulum. This is a spring loaded clock. And this, if you load the spring with this little uh, crank lever, or how is this called? If you load the spring, this will work for roughly one day, and then you have to reload the spring. And this clock is quite an interesting construction because there's no real reference oscillator inside. The clockwork itself, the spring loading mechanism with a little flywheel, yeah, the clockwork is the reference oscillator. It's, it's the same here. Yeah, and this really solved the longitude problem. <clears throat> but of course, uh, these types of clock were not the first clocks and also not the last one. So um, before that, there were pendulum clocks and there were sundials uh, quite some time before, if you want to call this a clock. And afterwards, what I wear on my wrist right now is a quartz clock. And in 1955, uh, the era of cesium atomic clocks started. Then there were the cesium fountain clocks. And since two 2007, we have the optical lattice clocks. And here for the last three types of clocks, I've just written down the types and the oscillator frequency here and the fractional uncertainty of today's clocks, so the best of, of each. So a quartz qu clock usually works around uh, 32 kilohertz, a cesium clock at 9.2 gigahertz, and a strontium lattice clock at four, uh, 430 terahertz. So you see the oscillation frequency uh, got higher and higher, five orders of magnitude difference here, another five orders of magnitude difference here. 
and a fractional frequency uncertainty is getting better and better. A factor of 1000 here and then a factor of 100, maybe also we're reaching now that 10 to the minus 19 level. Um, in a very simple picture, you can think about it like this. If you divide the second into equal parts of these oscillations here um, and you count these oscillations, then you might do an error. For example, you miss one oscillation, but if you miss one oscillation of uh, 32 kilohertz, this is of course much worse than missing one oscillation of 429 terahertz. So yeah, the fractional error is less if you miss one count for a higher frequency. Okay, <clears throat> and here's a comparison of microwave and optical standards. So in 1967, that was the redefinition of the second. It was defined as this number here of oscillations of the cesium hyperfine transition. And still today, this is the, de the definition of a second. So um, today, around the world, there are more or less 500 clocks, which contribute to the coordinated universal time. And here, the atomic fountain clocks in the 90s were invented, and you see the optical the all optical clocks here started also in the 80s, but back then uh, the atomic fountain clocks were far superior. At 2000, in 2010, they were more or less head to head, and then the optical lattice clock, uh, the optical clocks, were overtaking in sense of fractional frequency uncertainty here. And you can see today the aluminium ion clocks, strontium and terbium clocks, reach the very low 10 to the minus 18 level, which is quite impressive. And this is the reason why the whole world is discussing if we should redefine the second using optical clocks. So how does such an optical clock work? I've borrowed this picture from a very nice uh, Fritz Riele paper here. So we have the atoms, which are our reference oscillator, can be ions. This is a picture of an ion clock. This is a, uh, uh, should uh, be an optical lattice potential with yellow atoms inside, so it can be called atoms or ions. And we do some type of spectroscopy, for example, uh, Rabi spectroscopy. This gives you an absorption signal and tells you exactly where the transition frequency is, the clock transition frequency. From that, we can derive an error signal, which is then the feedback for our server system. And a server system then usually acts on a frequency comp, and the laser itself is locked to the frequency comp. So why is that? Well, for one reason, we can not count the laser frequency directly, so it's nice to uh, to hit the, trans the transition frequency, but if you cannot count the CW laser, this doesn't help much. So we have to divide the CW laser frequency down to the RF domain and then you out here, the repetition rate can be counted and you can derive a clock signal. And on the other hand, the frequency comp acts as a flywheel because usually you have the problem, uh, especially with cold atoms, they have to be prepared, loaded into traps and so on. And you also disturb the atoms by shining in the laser. So it's very hard or even impossible to lock the laser directly to the atoms or to get out a continuous signal, a continuous signal of the atoms. So what you really measure is the laser synchronized to the atoms. And of course, this has to have an intrinsic stability, which is good enough that in these oscillation, uh, sorry, in this preparation cycles here, you do not yeah, lose your timing signal. Okay. <clears throat> So what can you do with today's state-of-the-art optical lattice clocks? Well, you can, for example, test Einstein's theory of general relativity by putting two different clocks uh, in a tower. And this you see here on the left is the Tokyo Sky Tree. And a group of uh, Professor Katori in Tokyo uh, did these measurements, uh, supported by my dear colleagues, Michele Junta and Maurice Lessing, who were working day and night to make this happen. So what was done here? One optical clock was uh, located here, pretty much on the ground level. And the other one was located here on a platform in 450 meters height. And Einstein's uh, theory tells us that time ticks differently for different gravitational fields. So this means in the weaker, in the weaker field, so up high, the time should indeed tick a little bit faster. And this is exactly what I measured here, you can see uh, the excitation probability here. And you see when they exactly hit the resonance at zero, we are at the maximum here. And this is the ground floor clock. And this one is the clock at 450 meters and you indeed see a shift by 22 Hertz. Uh, sorry, I forgot that. Of course, these two lattice clocks are linked to each other with an optical fiber link here in yellow. And you can really measure this shift by 20 of 21 Hertz, which corresponds to 450 meters. And this is in perfect agreement with the theory of Einstein. And of course, they also <clears throat> wanted 
uh, reference measurements. So they also did laser ranging measurements and had gravimeters and GNS data. So everything was done very, uh, very properly here. And if you do the calculations and you see, okay, 450 meter corresponds to 21 Hertz, you can calculate, well, then one centimeter requires fractional accuracies and stabilities on the 10 to the minus 18 level. But as, as we have seen in the slide before, these clocks can provide the stability. So this really means you can measure the gravitational difference of only one centimeter, the difference in time, which is, I think, quite impressive. You could indeed quite easily measure the difference of time between your head and your feet. So your head is a little bit older than your feet. And uh, also this experiment was, of course, to show that uh, optical lattice clocks now have matured enough also to be used in the real life and outside the laboratory. So not only in, in Tokyo, uh, people have optical lattice clocks also on the other side of the world. For example, the group of Jun Ye has state-of-the-art optical lattice clocks. And what I wanted to show you is this uh, nice nature paper from 2019, where they demonstrated a stability of 4.8 10 to the minus 17 after only one second of uh, averaging time, which is also very impressive. So as you can see here, this was done in a group of Jun Ye. Uh, Gila in Colorado, and this was a project together with uh, the Physikalische Technische Bundesanstalt in Braunschweig and also Menlo Systems. So what did they do? Here's the setup. So they wanted to measure two different clocks, a 1D strontium lattice clock and a 3D strontium lattice clocks. And here we have two acousto-optical modulators. They are just needed to sweep over the atomic resonance to do the Rabi spectroscopy and the clock laser itself operating at 698 nanometer is locked to this ultra stable cavity here, 40 centimeter long cavity. Yeah, forget this AOM for a second. This is just the clock laser um, used for the spectroscopy here. But as before, you need a frequency comp to count uh, this clock laser's oscillations. But Junier was not uh, quite happy uh, with this ultra stable laser. He wanted to use an even better optical reference. So, what did he do? Well, the GILA is one of the few institutes who is capable of uh, dealing with this monocrystalline silicon cavities. And these are really the best uh, optical references you can have. They are quite impressive. Um, but on the downside, you cannot lock the clock laser at, nine, at, nine, uh, sorry, at 6, 9, 8 nanometer directly on the silicon, because silicon is not transparent at this wavelength. But luckily, it, it is transparent at 1.5 micrometers. So you take a 1.5 micrometer laser, you lock it to this cavity, then the red laser here is even more stable than this clock laser. And to transfer this even superior stability to the clock laser, he used the Menlo Systems Frequency Comp. So he locked the comp to the cavity, to the silicon cavity. The comp inherits the stability. And then with this AOM, the already pre-stabilized clock laser is then, well, finally stabilized to the frequency comp. All right. And of course, in such a complicated um, setup, you're always worried about, yeah, what is, what is the overall frequency stability, whereas the bottleneck is maybe the frequency comp here, the bottleneck. And of course, they wanted to check this, and they did. And I wanted to show you here the direct quote from the paper of this Nature Photonics paper. And it says, figure four depicts a characterization measurement of the optical frequency comp in figure one, which was the setup, which demonstrates spectral priority transfer at a 1.6 10 to the minus 18 level at one second. Consequently, the frequency comp is not a significant source of instability. Just to remind you, the overall clock stability was on the 10 to the minus 17 level. So the frequency comp is a factor of 10 better here at one second. And here you see the data to prove what I've, what I've just said. And beneath this, it says in the paper, spectral purity transfer of the local oscillator. Both frequency comps are locked to a common reference at 1542 nanometer. And the beat between their outputs at the clock transition frequency is analyzed. So this is shown here, two clocks locked to the same optical reference and the beat here is analyzed. And this is exactly how we at Menlo also do our comp, comp comparisons, the qualification measurements for our comps. So I want to show you a bit more detailed how this works. So if you uh, buy a combat mental system, then the qualification measurement will be like this. This is then your comp. We lock it to an ultra stable CW laser at 1542 nanometer. The offset frequency is also fixed. And this here's our reference comp. Now we slightly detune the offset frequency, for example, by 10 megahertz. And we also detune the set frequency of the beat between this comp mode here and the ultra stable laser. If you do that, if you do this shifting here for both frequencies, then you end up with a reference comp which has exactly the same repetition rate as the customer comp, but is shifted 
10 megahertz to the right. So all modes here are shifted by 10 megahertz. And then we measure the comp, comp beat note at the target wavelength, for example, this wavelength or yeah, your, your customer wavelength, what you need for your application. So the setup would look like this. This is really the minimal setup. We have one optic reference, we have two Menlo ULN comps, and we have one so-called beat detection unit, which superimposes these two light fields here and detect them on a foot diet. And now there are two things we are especially interested in, the short-term stability and the long-term stability. So the short-term stability is usually sp uh, specified by the phase noise. So what is phase noise? I try to do a little animation here. If you only compare one spectral line of COMP1, which I call reference light here, with one spectral line of COMP2, then these two spectral components over time look like a CW laser. Do not be confused, these are still pulsed lasers, but if you filter out narrow enough, then it looks like a CW laser. So there's only one component, one line of the frequency COMP. So this is the the reference light and the reference light per definition has zero phase noise because we can only measure relative phase noise. And here the <clears throat> spectral line of COMP2 is detuned by 10 megahertz because we just detuned the COMP and this includes the relative phase noise. And here in black is the superposition, so the beat signal you would measure and the envelope is then at 10 megahertz, the difference we can see between those two. And of course we cannot directly measure the carrier, we can only measure the envelope. And if I start the little animation here, you see the blue line now jitters a little bit. There is phase noise on the second comp and this phase noise is transferred, of course, to the beat signal. And you see that it is also transferred to the envelope. And so you have a very sensitive measure here of the optical, of, of the optical phase noise. It is directly down converted from the optical domain to the RF domain. And what you can see here, again, um, the envelope is the thing we can measure, and this is then compared to a 10 megahertz reference signal. This is just the reference signal input for your frequency counter, for example, or your RF spectrum analyzer. Now you might say, I don't trust this uh, little Python animation done by some product manager, but hopefully you trust uh, math. So if you have a look at the trigonometric identity here, two waves superimposed, one has the frequency omega one, which is our reference light here. The other one has omega two, which is the detuned light. And this also includes the relative phase noise. And if you have a look at the identity here, it reads then the cosine function is the envelope. So the difference of these two frequencies and it includes directly the phase noise. And this one is the carrier. So the sum frequency half, so the mean value. We cannot measure this part. This is the carrier. This is an optical frequency, but we can indeed measure the envelope here. And so this directly maps the optical phase noise down to the RF domain and can be measured. So how do you quantify? How do you quantify this? Well, this is done by the so-called power spectral density. And this is shown here, and this needs a little bit of explanation. So you can see here, it says carrier frequency 10 megahertz. So this is the oscillation we are looking at, the beat signal at 10 megahertz. An ideal signal with an infinitely small line width, so to say, would have all its power in the carrier. But a real, a real signal, of course, has not all the power only in the carrier in an infinite small frequency range. This is not possible. It's all, the power is always spread around the carrier. And this is exactly what is measured here on the x-axis. X, x sorry, It says start offset of 1 hertz. This is the green line here. Then it's 10, 100. It's a logarithmic scale. It goes up to 10 megahertz offset. And offset means frequency offset relative to the carrier. So this means 1 hertz away, 10 hertz away from the carrier itself, which is at 10 megahertz. And here you see 1 hertz away. So let's say on the right side of the carrier, 1 hertz away, the <clears throat> power spectral density of the phase noise already dropped by 6 orders of magnitude. So this says dBc here. So this means 6 orders of magnitude in relation to the carrier. This is the little c. And because it's a power spectral density, you always have to specify in which bandwidth you're measuring. And this is usually done in the bandwidth of one hertz. This is an astonishing low value here. And then we have uh, two tiny resonances here and two kilohertz away from the, uh, from the 10 megahertz carrier, we decrease the phase noise uh, power spectral density by a factor of another thousand. So this is really incredible low phase noise. You can also do the integral over the phase noise and in total we have an integrated phase noise of only 61 milliwatts here. And this is really, uh, yeah, the most meaningful measure, the phase noise. So if you're interested in, in lasers or in, in comps or yeah, 
you should really ask for phase noise data. This tells you everything. You can also derive the Allen deviation from this in theory. And for technical reasons, this is not so easy. But the phase noise includes all information you can get yeah, from an optical or RF signal. OK, so this was the short term stability. Now, how do we check the long term stability? Well, therefore, you connect your beat signal to a frequency counter. This simply counts the zero crossings of your signal in relation to your reference. And then you can do Allen deviation and also phase drift analysis. And this will tell you the long term stability. And here it is uh, the modified Allen deviation, so the fractional frequency instability of a state of the art optical frequency comp, in this case, the manual systems FC1500 ULN plus. And the COMCOM comparison was carried out at 698 nanometers, so very far away from the locking point. And what you can see here, after only one second of averaging time, we already reached three times 10 to the minus 18, which is quite impressive. And after 1,000 seconds, we are able to reach the 10 to the minus 20 level. And this uh, really makes me, makes me proud to be the product manager for these comps, because if you compare this to state-of-the-art optical lattice clocks, like the one from Junier, you see here, they average down here on the blue line. So this means we are more than an order of magnitude better here and fractional frequency and stability than the best optical lattice clocks. And I think this uh, data here really gives me the right to claim that the FC1500 ULN Plus is the perfect clockwork for optical lattice clocks. So, but still, of course, the clocks evolve, they get better and better, and also our comms are getting better and better. And if you ask yourself now, what, what is the, the limit here? Is this really the comp? Well, uh, I can tell you the fractional frequency and stability here. What we measure is also not really limited by the comp itself. It is indeed limited by out of loop fibers of our comp comp comparison. So they drift a little bit, um, and this limits then here your fractional frequency and stability. But also for that, there is a solution. Uh, sorry, here's the relative optical phase drift between two comps. You can directly measure them with a frequency counter. It also gives you the phase information. So what you see here over time, it's zero. The relative phase is just set to zero. And after one hour, the optical phases here really, this is are the optical phases at 429 terahertz. They drifted by around one pi, 180 degree. And then five hours later, the optical phases here have drifted by one optical cycle. And if you compare this to the expected frequency stability of 10 to the minus 19 or 18, you can see we're very close to the 10 to the minus 19 phase stability here. But if you want to improve on this phase drifts here of the out of loop fibers, there's also a solution for that. <clears throat> and my colleague, uh, Michele Junta is the expert for that. He did the measurements here. So the basic idea is to use a phase meter. And if you have uh, an amplifier here behind the comp, this will induce some phase drifts, and then you have disturbed frequencies, new one and new two. And here we have a reference frequency, which was uh, taken here before the amplifier. So this is the clean reference phase. This is the disturbed phase. And you can compare then, compare these two. You can get a ratio of these two, and you can then use this ratio to correct phi two here with distortions. And then you can, yeah, clean this distortion. So you can, rid, can get rid of these phase drifts in the data, or you actively use this as a server signal to steer fiber length here to, yeah, to correct these optical phase drifts. All right. So uh, yeah, now we have a little webinar poll. If you uh, attended in the first webinar, you already know the first question. What do you consider the most important feature in a frequency comp system? Ultimate stability and accuracy, compactness, transportability, versatility, or other things. And the second, uh, question is a little bit more specific this time. What fractional accuracy do you do you require for your clock or quantum application? 10 to minus 14, 15, 16, 17, or even better? And your feedback is, of course, highly appreciated. I'll give everyone maybe another 10 more seconds and then I can share this. Oh, thank you very much for your feedback. Ah, okay, we really have the high end customers here. That's interesting. Thank you very much. <clears throat> All right, also timing matters here, and I'm a little bit late, I have to admit. 
So um, now, second part of the talk, the real thing, the FC 1500 Quantum. So you can see here, this is one possible setup. This is a very highly customized uh, laser system. So here on the right, we have the ultra stable laser. In the middle, we have the complete optics rack and here are driving electronics and control rack. And uh, yeah, we work together with different CW laser suppliers, for example, M squared, Mock Labs or NKT Photonics, also Toptica and AOSense or the Ferdinand Braun Institute. So these are all suppliers CW lasers we successfully locked to our FC1500 quantum system. So you can just choose the supply you want. So yeah, just get the best comp and the best CW laser for your application. And you can see that these systems are highly customized because on the next slide, it looks a little bit different. And because we're a little bit late in time, I will not go through all details here. Um, just tell you in the middle, we have the optics rack and this includes eight drawers here in total, the optical frequency composite inside, the amplifiers you need, frequency conversion units, speed detection units, seven external cavidiate lasers in this case, two tapered amplifiers, second harmonic generation units, ultra several micro extraction and monitor units. So really a complete system, all the feedback loops, everything is, is included. <clears throat> so here, an overview about the lasers here for the special system built for strontium lattice clock application. We have a repump laser, we have two times narrow cooling laser for the red mod. This is just needed here, the second one for strontium 87. For strontium 88, you won't need this. The clock laser at 698.4 nanometers, a second repump laser, and these two here at 813 and at 922. Well, the laser itself does not operate at 922. Uh, we have to frequency double it for the blue mod. And you can see the powers here. So for the repumpers and the clock lasers, around 10 milliwatts are suitable for your lattice laser and also for the blue mod you need really a lot of light and the system also includes tapered amplifiers to provide all the power you need. And uh, on the other side these were the CW lasers these are now the spectra of the comp outputs so this is the spectrum you lock your CW laser to and you can see we can nicely shape the spectra we optimize them here for the clock transition for lattice and the narrow cooling transition to provide you the most possible power per comp mode. And this is also true for the repumping lasers and for the blue mod laser. Okay, so I've uh, shown you the comp comp comparison. And this looks uh, quite similar, but this time we are not doing a comp comp comparison. We of course wanted to know how well does our clock laser perform? Because now we know that we can do spectral priority transfer from the ultra stable laser to the comp, but we haven't shown that we can also transfer the spectral priority to the clock laser because also here you have to take care about uh, yeah a nice feedback loop to get subhertz line width on the clock laser. So the claim is that the clock laser inherits subhertz line width of the ultra stable laser via the comp. Yeah, we're doing spectral priority transfer via the comp. And if you now look at the clock laser comp beat node at 698 nanometer on a high end spectrum analyzer, it looks like this. This doesn't tell you much because you only see the limit of the spectrum analyzer, which is around one hertz. But we can be sure, since this is the clock laser comp beat, that both of them have subhertz line width. So this is good news. But to be more precise, we of course also measure the fractional frequency and stability of the CW laser. And here it is. And you can see the modified Allen deviation. At one second, we are capable of providing here seven times 10 to the minus 18 at one second, which is quite impressive. If you remember, the comp itself was at 3.10 to the minus 18. So the CW laser adds a certain amount of frequency and stability. This was expected, but still we are on the 10 to the minus 18 level, which is really, uh, yeah, really suitable for any known application so far. And after a thousand seconds, we also reached 10 to the minus 20 level here. Okay, <clears throat> and we were also, of course, uh, interested in the other CW lasers, but uh, yeah, the simple fact that our reference comp is much smaller than such a strontium clock lattice system, we cannot do the direct CW laser comp comparison for all the wavelengths. So we did it for the clock transition in, uh, yeah, of course, telling the customer, and uh, we asked the customer if it is okay to just check the in-loop signals here, and it is. So the in-loop signal does not tell you as much as an out-of-loop signal, but it tells you that your feedback loop works properly. So here you basically sh uh, are showing how well your feedback loop works and how it uh, follows the reference. And you can also see here, all the lasers are very tightly locked to our frequency comp. And since these lasers are exactly the same ECDL lasers as the clock laser, we can assume that also these lasers are on a comparable, comparable level. 
Okay. So to summarize this clock system, how do we really make a clock out of this? So um, I tried to make this picture here. So we have the infrared comp, which is locked to the ultra stable laser. We lock all the lasers we need here in the visible to the frequency comp. And here's the clock laser probing the atoms. So you need an AOM to do the Rabi spectroscopy. You sweep over the transition and then you will, for example, find out, well, this frequency here, you know the exact value plus let's say 50 megahertz. There is the exact transition frequency here. And then on the next day, you do the same measurement and you will notice, aha, today it's a little bit different here on the AOM. The transition frequency seems to have shift a tiny little bit. Of course, the atoms did not shift. What happens here is that the ultra stable CW laser here uh, drifts a little bit over time. This is a problem with these uh, spacers. They drift over time, so they drift very slowly, but they do drift. But this is not a real problem because you have the atoms, you have an absolute frequency reference, and therefore you just scan over the transition, you determine the exact value of your transition, and then you compare this um, every day or every hour, every second if you want, and then you can basically read out and map the linear drift of your ultra stable cavity. And if you know the ultra stable cavity drift, for example, 0 0.1 hertz per second, if you measure this, then you can of course correct the cavity drifts. So you get back a steering signal here, which then corrects the delta F. And if you do so, then the frequency comp itself is really directly yeah, locked to the atoms, so to say. So it's synchronized by the atomic transition and then everything is fine. Nothing's drifting anymore. And you can read out the clock laser by reading out the repetition rate. And you might think, why do I need this infrared part here at all? I could also use an ultra stable laser here in the optical domain and the visible domain, sorry. You could, but there's a problem uh, because if you want to do the readout, you also have to really be careful how to do the readout. And you do not want to mess this up because if the readout is not done properly, yeah, then uh, the whole clock is, is uh, not very helpful. And the best photodiodes you can have are working in the infrared. So you should take a highly linear photodiode in the infrared and the comp operates at 1542 nanometers anyway. Also, the CW lasers here are even higher, more reliable than visible CW lasers. So this is uh, really the setup you should go for. And if you measure then the repetition rate, count it there uh, from this counter, you can then derive in the end, the clock signal, the real time signal. And also um, what is also very beneficial to have a, a comp which is capable of doing spectral purity transfer over the complete optical spectrum here, if you want to compare your clock to another clock, then you would uh, lock your frequency comp to a fiber link CW laser. And so you would, of course, you would lock the laser to the frequency comp. And this is also can only be done in the infrared because fiber networks do not operate in the visible. Okay, so this was the system for Sontium clock applications. Of course, this is a more general concept. Also other people like our friends here from Atom Computing using our frequency comp FC1500 quantum systems for cooling and trapping their atoms and for readout and manipulation of, uh, of their qubits. And in total, they locked nine different lasers to our Menlo comp. And as you can see here, they have perfect control over the optical lattice. They can change from square grid to checkerboard and to pairwise. And here you see average over the whole qubit array, uh, yeah, a clock, a clock pulse, so to say. And here you can even see a single qubit Rabi oscillation, which is quite impressive and yeah, looks like textbook behavior here, hovering around 0 0.5. Okay, now last but not least, the photonic microwave generator. As I told you before, you also have to be capable of reading out your frequency comp uh, very precisely for clocks. And uh, yeah, since you can generate ultra stable microwaves with a frequency comp and an optical reference system, we decided to offer this as a standalone unit. So what do we have here? Here's the RS cubic vacuum system, including the high finesse cavity. We have the microwave extraction unit, hundred River Hall locking electronics to lock the CW laser to the high finesse cavity. And then here is smart comp to divide the optical, uh, to divide the optical frequency down to the microwave domain. And how is this done? Well, the basic idea is very simple, but the technical implementation is a bit tricky. So you lock your comp to the optical reference. As shown in the first webinar, we close the feedback loop for the repetition rate over the preamplifier and the speed detection unit. The optical 
uh, the optical reference light is superimposed with the light from the comp and the beat signal between comp and CW laser is then used as an error signal here. And then you can simply detect this on a highly linear photodiode and what you see is this type of spectrum here. So this is a frequency comp with 250 megahertz repetition rate and you see 250 megahertz, 500, 750 and so on. And depending on your photodiode, you can see this up to the gigahertz domain, maybe if you have a very good photodiode, even to 50 gigahertz. But you, of course you also see there are saturation effects. The power here, the signal to noise ratio for low frequencies is much better than for high frequencies. And we can improve there by using a so-called interleaver. So what is an interleaver? An interleaver is a fiber-based pulse rate multiplier. And what is that? Well, here's the input signal. Then we split um, the laser beam here into two parts. And this part here is just longer than the other part. And it's longer in such a way that the light takes tau half longer to get to point B compared to this path here. So this means if the time between two pulses is given by tau, then at point A, you have the standard repetition rate. And at point B, well, these pulses here are delayed so they are right in the middle between these pulses. So one of these here then doubled the repetition rate. And this is a three-stage interleaver here. So we <clears throat> multiplied our repetition rate by a factor of eight in total. And this is then how it looks like without interleaver and here with interleaver. You see the interleaver does not work 100% perfect. You still see the 250 megahertz grid here but indeed two gigahertz, four gigahertz, six gigahertz, the four, uh, sorry, the two gigahertz grid is quite enhanced with this interleaver. And for example, at 12 gigahertz, if you want a very clean 12 gigahertz microwave signal, we can offer you a signal to noise ratio improvement of almost two orders of magnitude with this interleaver. Okay, so now how does this look like? Again, we want to quantify the phase noise by doing this with a single sideband phase noise measurement here. And you uh, now have to know what I also tried to explain in the first webinar. The clue about the thing is that you already have a very good optical reference. So the phase noise of your optical reference is already very good. But if you down convert this with a frequency comp, it is down converted with the mode number index n to the power of two, so with n squared. And if you do the calculations here, there's a phase noise scaling factor. So the phase noise is scaled down by this factor, the microwave carrier over the optical carrier, 20 times the logarithms of that in dB. So for example, if you have an optical reference at 194 terahertz, which is 1542 nanometer, and you want a microwave carrier at 12 gigahertz to derive from that, the phase noise is down converted by 84 dB. So eight orders of magnitude, which is quite impressive. And this is what I've shown here. The blue line is the optical phase noise of the ultra stable laser down converted with this factor of 84 dB. So this is really the theoretical limit we can reach. It's not getting better than that. And in red, this is the real data. And you can see this really nicely follows the theoretical prediction. We are losing almost nothing. This is more or less a perfect spectral purity transfer down to the microwave domain above one kilohertz. Here we are um, then limited by shot noise and other technical noise. Here in the end, there's a little servo bump. We also improved here, but still this is a very impressive phase noise for a 12 gigahertz carrier. You see here minus 170 dBc over Hertz. This is, uh, you cannot uh, buy this in a usual RF uh, device. Okay, and I think now um, we are perfectly on time again. Of course, we invite you to enter your questions, uh, but stay tuned. We now have the we now have the product demo video, and also you can contact us, of course, on sales at mendelsystems.com. So this is all I wanted to tell you. And now my colleague uh, Maximilian Radler will show you our FC fifteen hundred ULN, so our scientific platform of the frequency comp, and also our FC fifteen hundred quantum is based on this system type. And he will show you how to perform a lock to our RF reference and also how we can easily switch to an optical reference. And he will also show you how to determine the mode number of a CW laser we are measuring without the need to use a wave meter. So that's it from my side. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you for your attention. Hope to hear from you soon. Bye bye. Jack, I don't believe the audio is coming through. Oh, so what do we do next? 
If you could reshare the video and click the audio button, the share audio button. Yeah, it has. And then turn up the volume on your computer. Okay. No, it's not working. I'll explain you ah, where your ultra has come on the previous slides. Perfect. I will now show you the system in real. So, hello, everyone. I hope you're enjoying the webinar. Since Doug ex explained you the ultra low noise come on the previous slides, I will now show you the system in real life. So let's start with the optical components on the base plate. So here we have the figure nine oscillator with the preamplifier. Beside this, we have the FD2F interferometer to generate our CO beat. And here on this side, we have a beat detection unit to generate a beat between our frequency comp and the ultra stable CW laser. Beside this optics, we also have an electronics rack, and there we have our PC, our laser and amplifier control, and our devices to lock the repetition rate and the CEO beat. And finally, we have here our touch screen to where we can have our software to control the comp and also remote control of our locking devices for CEO beat and the repetition rate. And we have here our USB, RF spectrum analyzer, and oscilloscope. So you can see your full comp here with the PC. So what do we see? Here on the upper left side, we have the free running uh, CO beat. And here on the upper right side, we have the beat of the free running comp versus our CW laser. And from this free running CO beat, we can learn a, a little bit of the properties of our, of our free running comp. And to do so, we take this CW beat and give it to our high level state of the art of spectrum analyzer and see what is the line width of our system. So because the CO beat gives us, uh, um, gives us the intrinsic line width of the system. And you can see here, we have again a uh, descent signal to noise ratio and on a lo logarithmic scale our beat. But to get some information about the line width, we change now to the linear scale and you will see we have a span of 500 kilohertz. So this means one device is about 50, one division is about 50 kilohertz, and you see that we have something around 25 kilohertz. So we know that our system has an intrinsic line width of 25 kilohertz. So what we now do, we now lock our system. So we activate the CO lock, and you see the CO is not free running anymore. It's locked to an F reference, and we will do the same for the repetition rate. We activate the lock, and now our comp is fully locked to an F reference. And so let's therefore have a look at our CW beat. As you remember before, we saw the CW beat between our comp and the ultra narrow CW laser. And again, what you see here, this is the CW beat, and it's quite stable, so it's not changing its frequency because all of our comp lines are locked, and so there will be no change of the center frequency. And again, you see the frequency, uh, you see the line width, which is around the 25 kilohertz, and this is, and in this configuration, you can do a lot of different measurements, like measuring the CW frequency, and but if you want to reduce the line width, you can also apply the optical lock. This means we will not lock our comb to our F reference. We now will profit from a good CW laser and lock our comb on this system. And to do this, it's quite simple. We unlock the system, we load the optical lock settings and activate the lock. And then we see that the line width shrink down to, yeah, that's a good question, to what? So let's have a closer look here. We again go back on the linear scale, and we have again the span of 500 kilohertz, and we see here that we have a resolution that we are limited by the resolution of our spectrum analyzer. So let's increase the span. Let's go down to from 500 kilohertz to 10 kilohertz. And then even we see here that we are still limited by the 
resolution of the spectrum analyzer. So let's go further down. Let's go down to one kilohertz. But again, the same situation. So let's go down the thing, the possible lowest possible resolution here is down. We, let's go to 10 hertz. And then even here we see that we are limited by the re resolution of our F spectrum analyzer. And this means with our, you know, when we're locking to an optical reference, we can achieve that every um, comp line has a sub hertz line width. And our frequency comp is now optically locked. And the next step we want to do is to find out the signs of the CO and the CW bead. And we can do this during the optical lock. To explain this, I will use our ultra stable CW laser and our frequency comp. During the optical lock, we have two fixed points. One is the CEO bead, and the other one is the frequency between the ultra stable laser and the next comp mode. Here you see that the CEO bead is at 35 megahertz and also the uh, CW bead is also 35 megahertz. So what we will do now is that we increase the lock point from 35 to 36 megahertz. And if the CW laser would be here on this side, you see that the 35 megahertz increase and you see how the repetition rate would go down. If it would be on the other side, then we would have the 35 megahertz increase it to 36. And then you see how the repetition rate increases. So by changing the lock frequency between the ultra stable laser and the next comp mode, we can identify by looking at the repetition rate if we have a positive or a negative CW bead. And so this is what we now do. So we have here our optical lock. We go to the synthesizer, go to the 35 megahertz, and we now increase the um, the lock frequency, and if you look at the repetition rate here, we see that the frequency is going down. So this means we have a positive uh, CW beat. Then we go back, and you can also see, then let's do the same for the CO beat. We go to the synthesizer, go to the 35 megahertz, change the frequency, increase it, and we also see that the uh, repetition rate is going down. So this means we have also a positive CO beat. And due to the behavior of the actor, as we know, we also set our settings in the lock devices that way that you just easily can look at the sign here of the locking electronics. And to find out the CW beat and CO beat, you don't have to do any determination. You just look at the home screen of your locking electronics and it tells you that, that you have a positive or negative sign of the CO or the CW bead. And since we now know how to determine the sign of the CO bead and the CW bead, the next step will be to determine the mode number. To do so, we need to do two or more measurements. So let's start with this first set of measurements. So we have now the CO bead and the CW bead locked and let's now measure the repetition Great. For this, we can just open our recording software, start a measurement, and measure roughly 30 seconds. OK, so the first measurement is done. And to get a second measurement, we must now change the repetition rate. And to change the repetition rate, we will first unlock the lock to optical refer reference. We will then move the stepper motor by 20 steps. This changes the repetition rate of our, of our frequency comp. And then we will activate the lock again. And then we have our second set of measurements. And again here, we will make, you can also see that the repetition rate changed and now we make a second measurement. And again, wait 30 seconds. Okay, so that's the second measurement. 
And as I told you, there would be more measurements would be nice. So you can repeat a third, fourth, fifth measurement by strongly changing the repetition. Rate. We have done this and now we have the three set of measurements and then we can use our mode number, fund, mode number finder and to enter these values and then we will get out the CW frequency of our CW laser and also of course the mode number. So we have this script here and I will also record this window when and so you see we have three measurements so the first measurement we were typed in and for the second and for the first and second one we still have to enter the values so let's record this one then we have our first measurement was measurement one and we have here our first repetition rate we have to enter. The good thing is, since we know that our CO and CW, they were locked to 35 megahertz and we know that we had a plus, so we don't need to care about the CO and optical beat frequency, we just and have to enter the frequency here. So that's for measurement number one. Then let's go to the second measurement load measurement number two and so here we have the second repetition rate average so we have typed in our three sets of measurement the next thing is so we know roughly the frequency of our CW laser it's here 1542.1 nanometer and if we say it is in terahertz is 194.4 terahertz. So our search range is plus minus 100 gigahertz and the assumed optical precision is how strong would the CW laser drift during the measurement. Here we have a uh, ultra stable CW laser so it won't drift very much. So therefore we have now set all parts here. We can press compute and then we see we get different solutions and you see the probability here is close to one, the other one are by 1%. So here we can find out our mode number 777606 and our optical frequency is 9194.4 terahertz and so on. And here from the DF max, we know we have something like 13 kilohertz deviation. Great. So thank you, Doug, for this beautiful presentation and Max for the demo. And many thanks also to our audience for the questions. We hope you could, we could answer most of them. And if you have further questions, please email us on salesandmenosystems.com. We will be happy to send you also a menu t-shirt if you, want, if you uh, would like one. And also please share your feedback on our webinar via our survey, which will, which will be provided to you via email. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you, Patricia. Thank you, Dag. Um, and thank you to you all for attending today's webinar. Um, I'd like to just remind everyone again that today's webinar was being recorded. So a copy of the video will be available online. Um, everyone here should receive an email from a uh, Zoom in the next uh, two days with that link again copied in case you did not have a chance to write it down in the chat box. Um, and it'll also include a link to the additional materials that Menlo has provided, which I also um, about 10 minutes ago copied in the chat box as well. Um, if you guys have any other further questions, I highly recommend reaching out to Menlo directly, but I appreciate your attendance and time today on um, today's webinar and thank you again to Menlo for hosting today's content and I'll see you all at the next one.